All right. Good day. Good day. <laughs> funny face, um, Martin. That's a funny face. <laughs> yeah. I had to say hello to people. In the... <laughs> hello to the people. <laughs> well, I'm super excited. Good day, everybody. Um, hope everybody's doing well. We've been having amazing days here in Seattle. Now it's actually today, a typical normal day, a rainy day. Um, but this is gonna, we're gonna make it way better now that we got Martin Cake today. We're gonna be talking about rum and tiki. Um, first of all, let me just, before I start, let me bring Martin Kate to the big screen so he can say hello to everybody. Hello, everybody. <laughs> How are you? Around this fair planet of ours on this wonderful day. <laughs> All right, let me, let's start with the presentation. I'm gonna bring the big, um, so for today, with regarding the introduction, uh, we have, uh, as mentioned, we got Martin Kate. Let me talk a little bit about the tools that we have. Uh, to the right, there's a chat box. Uh, I see a lot of people have been already writing, even since earlier today, which is phenomenal. Uh, if you can let us know, especially let Martin know where you're visiting or where you're from, the city, country, uh, state, it will be phenomenal. Uh, if you have any questions, actually, we also see a lot of people have already put, started writing questions. Please write it down on the below, below the screens. And to see this, for those people that are watching us through Facebook Live, go to Savvy.co and you can participate directly to this event. Today's agenda we it's going to be 30 40 minutes talking about the main presentation which uh and then we're going to go to our q a which is our rum o'clock i am uh intrigued to know what martin k is going to pop out or bring out to the public uh i'm already i'm, I'm already nervous I'm, I'm like i'm always jealous already <laughs> and uh, and then uh so let's jump into today's agenda really quickly uh, today's topic picking martin's kate brain about rum and tiki uh, our guest, of course, is Martin Kate. For those who do not know Martin Kate, uh, Martin Kate is, Martin Kate is a rum and exotic cocktail expert and the owner and creator of Smuggler's Cove in San Francisco. Smuggler's Cove features the largest rum selection in the United States and features cocktails from three centuries in uh, centuries of rum history. He's also the co-owner of White Chapel in San Francisco, Haley Pale in Portland, False Idol in San Diego, and partnered in Lost Lake in Chicago. Um, Martin and Rebecca Kate book, uh, Martin and Rebecca Kate book, Smuggler's Cove, Exotic Rum, uh, Exotic Cocktails, Rum and the Cult of Tiki was published by 10 Speed Press in June of 2006 and won the 2017 James Beard Award for the Best Beverage Book and the 2017 Spirit Award for Best Cocktail Book. I actually, the way I, I met Martin is when I was trying to start the California Rum Festival and our a good friend of ours, uh, Guillaume Lamy, or Guillaume from Plantation Rum, uh, he's like, Federico, if you want to start a rum festival in, in California, you have to talk to Mr. Martin Kate. Uh, and, and Martin was ever since super nice with me. Uh, uh, super helpful. He's been a big mentor of mine for it, for it, things that I do. Well, let me bring Martin Kate really quickly once again to the big screen. <laughs> I'm here. All right. And then, uh, Martin, um, let's go. We, I have a, a series of questions for today. Um, and I'm sure people are going to really enjoy this. So let's start with what did you do prior to being in the food and beverage business or industry? The past life. Sure. So the past life was... Uh, Gosh, it feels very distant now. Uh, the past life was spent in transportation logistics. So I was actually involved in, I was a, many years I was a freight forwarder, which is a uh, not especially glamorous occupation, but uh, a, a, a basically a travel agent for cargo. So when you see those giant container ships at sea, I was sort of uh, brokering what was uh, go, getting on board and helping people with their logistics planning. Um, I mostly represented um, dried fruit and nut and fresh produce growers from California, Central Valley. Um, I would, uh, they would call me up and say, I have three 
uh, 20 foot containers of raisins to send to Stockholm and I would help uh, book travel and such uh, on, uh, on steamships for that. So that was my, my past life and I worked for various steamship companies and things like that. And, um, and all the time I had been very actively um, getting into the nascent sort of tiki scene and collecting things. And, uh, and um, as this joke kind of goes, I went out to visit a, uh, an account out in the Central Valley about raisins and, and um, on a sales call, I was, and I was telling them very excitedly about all the thrift stores and antique malls I had visited on the way to my meeting and how many uh, vintage uh, tiki mugs I'd picked up. And they were kind of looking at me like I was an idiot. And um, and I just sort of realized that um, I was not in the right field. <laughs> or just that, uh, I don't know, I wasn't connecting with people the way I wanted to. So um, that uh, led to a change of pace, a uh, dramatic change of pace. I um, wrote about it in the book, but um, I had been laid off by one of my uh, employers and I went to a, uh, they got me some counseling, career counseling as a, uh, as a, uh, as a parting gift. Um, and, uh, I, and I remember saying to the, uh, to, to my therapist, I said, oh, you know, I keep thinking, I, you know, I have this such this love for tiki bars and, and for rum and for this, you know, and I love customer service and I love the guest experience and I love doing sales, but I got to sell things I want to sell. And I just think, you know, I'm not very good at anything, but I'm okay at a lot of little things. And I thought, you know, I think I've got the skill set to, to own and operate a, a tiki bar. I think I'd be really good at it. And they were just uh, uh, mortified. She was just mortified. She looked at me. She said, oh, no. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, a bar. Oh, God. I, I, in all good conscience, I couldn't recommend that you open a bar. That would be very irresponsible of me. So, um, anyway, I kind of laugh about that sometimes. But, um you know, eight bars later. Um, <laughs> eight bars later. Eight bars later. So yeah. Uh, but anyway, um, so that was that was the past life. So it was not um, it was not especially glamorous. It was interesting at times, but not especially glamorous. Wow. Ah. Well, um, Martin, there's a lot of people here from everywhere. There's uh, people from Sweden, of course, all California, oh, Connecticut, sure. Canada. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is this is this is great. A lot of people do love you. Great. Well, it's nice to see. Yeah. The all right. Um, I, I see a lot of people are already starting to um, put a lot of questions. So this is going to be a great session today. Okay, let's go to question number two. How did you get involved into into the tiki culture, and what happened at the current moment with the culture? What was happening at that moment? At that point, oh God, it was so uh, it was so small back then. It was such a, it was just in its very nascent years of the revival. There was a um, a nexus of people who were intrigued in it in Southern California. That was really kind of there are certainly pockets in New York and Chicago and other places, but the most active nexus was sort of centered around Southern California, where Sven Kirsten and and Jeff Berry and Otto von Stroheim were, and they were all meeting each other, connecting, finding vintage mugs and thrift stores, and and starting to have parties and get-togethers to try to discuss. In other words, you know, they were kind of trying to piece together this um, lost civilization, as we like to think of it. I mean, when when all of these places were torn down to virtual non-existence, when this massive trend came crashing down in the 70s and 80s. And there's only a handful of survivors left. Um, it was, um, you know, it, it became harder and harder to find information and to kind of de decode what these places used to look like by finding old postcards or menus and things like that. So when I got into the scene, I was uh, in '94, um, and it wasn't really a scene yet. But in '94, I went to my first Trader Vic's, which was Washington D.C which is gone, long gone, sadly, but um, I was completely floored. It would absolutely blew my mind. I never knew anything um, could look like that or be like that. I was, un I was an unknown experience to me in, in a dining, you know, in a restaurant that you could walk in and have this transformative journey from this very staid and gray marble edifice of the um, of the Hilton in Washington, D.C., and you went into the basement and there was just this sort of portal, this magical doorway flanked by flickering torches, and you walked in and everything just changes. And this notion 
of leaving the outside world behind into this very enveloping, cozy, relaxed environment that really helped, you know, where you could really feel like you could loosen the tie and take a deep breath and just feel tension fall away and just feel like you could, you could just relax again. And then, you know, of course you'd have a wonderful, you'd have a wonderful tropical drink in your hand and you'd have a, um, and uh, you just, uh, that was, that was the beauty of it. That's what, that's what flipped the switch in my mind uh, really and, and fully and formally was seeing that. And so, I moved to San Francisco after that, and my then girlfriend, now wife, over there, <laughs> um, uh, we built a home tiki bar in our a little apartment in San Francisco, and started to meet other like-minded people. Started to connect with other folks who were in the scene, and um, and had them over to our place, and just started making drinks and piecing together recipes, and uh, and eventually it just kept kind of going from there until I finally decided to. Uh, have a meltdown um and uh, after my after losing a job being laid off for the i don't know ten thousandth time from the shipping company that was downsizing my position and moving them to texas um that i would uh i would uh, go ahead and uh, I, so I, I said here i'll give you guys a really dated reference there's some old people on here but i call this my uh <laughs> it, it was my uh, richard dreyfus mashed potato mountain moment where i decided to build a home tiki bar at my new place Anybody, if anybody gets that, first person uh, gets an attaboy when you put that in the comment field. Um, but I, uh, that's where I just kind of flipped out and I just was working from home and decided to build a home bar and then kept doing it for fun until it wasn't fun and it was a job. <laughs> Thank you, Donovan. Well done. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> the. Well, if Rebecca's around, I'll, I, well, she should come and say hello to everybody. One uh, second. At some she, point. You want to say hi to anybody? Let me see. No, she's debating. She's debating. She's in a hoodie. <laughs> all right. All right. Maybe later. Maybe later. Maybe later. <laughs> the, um, all right. Let's go to question number three. Um, what profile of rum do you usually look for when developing a Smuggler's Cove limited expression? I imagine you. I imagine your rum profile has changed during the years. What has changed in the last five years? Well, when we do private bottlings for Smuggler, Smuggler's Cove, and I think we've done nineteen of them now, maybe. Um, I'm looking for a couple of things, and what, at first it was a case of what can't I get in the market, and that was a that was a big push. So it was where where do I feel the holes are? Where do I what do I think needs to be plugged? And so there was some of that. And thankfully, in this the rum market we're living in now, it's actually getting better and better. There's so much more available, you know, regularly available in the United States uh, now and so many more products we can get. And, of course, a booming craft um, scene as well, which is uh, very exciting. And so we have all this great stuff. So now I've kind of switched to... Um, um, now I've kind of switched to a combination of getting an unusual expression from somebody and um, and also I'm trying to kind of collect all of my favorite stills. Um, I'm trying to convince my favorite distilleries and I've done pretty well so far to say, all I want is that, I love that still so much. I love the output of that still. I love the way, I love the characteristics that are developed um, and with that with that distillation and the fermentation you normally use and I would I just want that by itself That's what I want um, So and usually something cast strength and, and non chill filtered and something like that Which I'll be drinking later. I have it down here looking at me on the floor next to me <laughs> It's very hard not to start drinking <laughs> and I don't know why I'm punishing myself. Maybe I should start drinking. Yeah, well, it looks sunny in San Francisco. Yeah. Nice. It, it looks very sunny. nice and sunny. It is sunny. It's a nice day. I can see that productivity will rapidly slip away as soon as I hit the bottle. So, uh, but yeah, you know. Um, but yeah, so right now I'm having fun collecting some of my favorite stills, as it were, just to, to be able to offer them. And, and one of the best things we've been able to do out at Smugglers is, is form really great retail partnerships with some of the terrific independent um merchants out here um and that we can say i can i can get a whole cask of something i really want and i can keep about a third of it and i can let two-thirds of it go to a retailer so that it can get out into the world and more people can enjoy it because it's uh sometimes can be really hard 
uh, for me to get through 200 bottles of something. If it's reasonably expensive, it's hard to convert it into an affordable cocktail. So, um, so yeah, so that's been really fun. And that's been a, that's been a real treat. So, I mean, now, um, a few projects have been canceled in light of current world events, but unfortunately, but hopefully we'll be back in action and we'll be doing some more later. All right. I, I remember like the first time that I started seeing, um, it was, it was, was it plantation rum that started doing one of the first, uh, brands like additions for, 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 for bars. Yeah, Plantation started doing, um, started taking some of their uh, more intriguing experiments and uh, making them these black label releases. And we've done several of those uh, that were particularly interesting, either because it was an, a great way to access a, a rarely bottled rum or just because the finish that they were using an unusual cask that was kind of exciting. Um, we did one with them recently where we did a, a, a wonderful uh, long pond. Uh, Jamaican rum, with pretty nice ester count at a lovely 105 proof, and it had been finished in a Teeling Irish whiskey cask, and so it really brought some really cool uh, additional sort of unusual multi notes to it. It was just kind of a fun experiment, and so, but it's incredibly uh, satisfying rum. So yeah, that's a uh, that's that's that's. It's awesome when you go to Smuggler's Cove. Those who have not been able to go to Smuggler's Cove, uh, not only they do amazing cocktails, they have an amazing team as well that are so extremely knowledgeable. Uh, most of, I, I say in most, all the bars that Martin Cave is related have phenomenal cocktails. I, I, my thoughts is the best factory for me in the world is at the at um, at Lost Lake, too. Uh, which is Martin and Kate is a partner at there over there in Lost Lake in Chicago. All right, let's go to another question is, what classification of rum are you currently preaching about and why? Well, we developed a rum classification system for our book, but it wasn't the thing that's kind of uh, the misconception is that we thought that it should be the world's rum classification, which I don't think it should be. I think it's the classification for users of our book. It's the classification for people to, because we devised a system where by you would select rums from a certain category and we would just say, use that category. And you'd find out, you know, based on your own exploration, your own journey, where your favorite profile was, what made sense to you from a flavor standpoint. Oh yeah, this falls in the same category as that rum, but it's significantly different in character. And I really like the way it works and drinks in my place. What we really want to do is keep encouraging people, wanted to keep encouraging people to, to, have a better understanding when they're shopping to make them more informed consumers um, when they're going to retail stores and to develop in, a, in effect their own house profile. When you take, oh, I like this one, I like this one, I like this one, those three work really well together in this particular drink, that's kind of the way drinks taste at our house. I think that's fun. I think that's what's kind of interesting rather than trying to promote a more um, homogenous sort of vision of what we think the actual rum should be in this drink. I wanted to say, try this category of rum, blend it with this category, experiment. And then, you know, when you go to say, um, you know, Linda and Joe's house or whatever, you go, well, drinks taste like this at Linda and Joe's house. That's the house profile. And it's kind of fun that way, because that way you get to have kind of a signature flavor. And also it, most of the time you're making drinks at home for yourself. so. What, what I think is necessarily the best brand per se for the drink may not be what you think. And I'd rather, you know, you know, <laughs> the whole point is you're drinking to, you know, you're drinking for your own personal enjoyment, not, yeah. to, not to uh, Im Im impress me or anyone else. What do you think is, what do you think is good? Hey, actually, you know what I think uh, using that particular rum from that country is, is eh, it's kind of too strong to or this one doesn't have enough body or enough texture or enough character. Why don't I try something, you know, richer? I mean, it's, it's, I, I, I find it, um, I, I find, I, I just want people to know that the, you know, it's, you have freedom of choice. You can, uh, you can make the drink that you want to make <laughs> that you think tastes good because that's kind of the end of the day, what matters. So, yeah. I, so, yeah. Go ahead. I, I'm, I'm constantly asking, I'm sure. You're the first one who should be asked this all the time. It's like, which is your favorite, uh, your favorite rum? And then I'm like, my, 
my perfect answer or my honest answer, it's not my perfect answer, it's my honest answer is like not every day I want to have I want to have scrambled eggs. So, and so and there's a run for every experience on how I feel at different moments of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wonder what's your what's your intake about this? Oh, the, 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 the best rum for me is whatever is left in the house during a global fucking pandemic. That's the <laughs> Try it. It's my favorite. <laughs> Seriously. 